Hello, and thank you once again for joining me. My name is Mindy Mandel, and this video is part of a series of videos on Proclus' Elements of Theology. In this video, I'm going to focus on Propositions 201 through 204. For those of you who would like to see the full playlist, I will link it here. And as I've been doing throughout the series, I am using the E.R. Dodds translation. And there is a link in the description box for a PDF. And starting with Proposition 201, this one is focusing on divine souls. All divine souls have a threefold activity. First, in their threefold capacity as souls. Second, as recipients of a divine intelligence. And third, as derived from gods. And then Proclus takes them backwards. As gods, they exercise providence towards the universe. In virtue of their intellectual life, they know all things. And in virtue of the self-movement proper to their being, they impart motion to bodies. So now Proclus is going to explain these three activities of divine souls. And notice that he described them in reverse order, starting with their providential function. He is going to stay with this ordering in his explanation. He starts off by saying that it belongs to their nature to participate the supra-jacent principles. What does he mean by supra-jacent principles? He's talking about those that are prior to, beyond, higher than. And it is their nature to participate these higher principles because they are not souls merely, but divine souls manifesting on the psychic plane a rank that is analogous to the gods. This idea of divine souls holding a rank that is analogous to the gods was introduced in Proposition 185. And we see it in the first line here. All divine souls are gods upon the psychic level. And here is what follows from that. It follows that they exercise not only a psychic, but also a divine activity, in that the summit of their being is possessed by a god. And so this shows their connection to divinity. Now next, Proclus looks at their connection to intellect and their function as divine intelligences. Before I go on, though, I do want to remind you of Proposition 112, which showed that the first members of any order have the form of their priors. And so the highest members in the rank of soul are connected to intellect, which is the realm just above or beyond or prior to, um, to the realm of soul. And so there is a continuity of procession in the universe. And this is why soul is seen as intellectual. And back at Proposition 201, we see here that because divine souls have an intellectual substance or hypostasis, which renders them susceptible of influence from the intellectual essences, they use not only a divine, but also an intellectual activity. The former based upon the unity within them the latter upon their imminent intelligence. And so we already see that they are intellectual, and now we see that because they are intellectual, they are influenced by intellect. We can see this more clearly in Proposition 182. And this one states that every participated divine intelligence is participated by divine souls. But what I really want to focus on is the part in yellow, that participation assimilates the participant to the participated principle. And that is really what it means to participate. Okay, so divine souls are assimilated through participation to the intellect that they participate. So what? And this is the last part of the sentence. 
They use not only a divine but also an intellectual activity, the former based upon the unity within them, the latter upon their immanent intelligence. So they exercise a divine activity through the unity that they participate and enjoy, as well as a certain intellectual activity through participation in intellect. Now this is different from what we saw back in Proposition 194. Here we saw that every soul possesses all the forms which intelligence possesses primitively, because soul in general is intellectual. And we saw at the end there that soul possesses by derivation the irradiations of the intellectual forms. But the divine souls not only possess these irradiations of intellectual forms, but they are participating in nous or intellect at all times. All souls enjoy an intellectual life, but divine souls more so, more intimately. So, And now back at Prop 201, we are looking at the third activity of divine souls. And their third activity is that which is proper to their special mode of being as souls. Their function is to move what is naturally moved ab extra, which means from outside, and to bestow life upon principles whose life is adventitious which is another way of saying from outside. So we have two functions here. The first is moving things that do not have self-motion, things that are alter motive, bodies basically. And this takes us back to Proposition 20. And we've seen this one a number of times. I'm just going to focus quickly on the part that's in yellow. When soul is present, the body is in some sense self-moved, but not when soul is absent showing that body is naturally moved from without, while self-movement is of the soul's essence. And so this is one of the activities of all souls. And the other half of this is that they bestow life on principles whose life is adventitious or from outside. And for this one, I just want to remind you quickly of Proposition 188, that every soul is at once a principle of life and a living thing. And in the course of this proof or explanation, Proclus told us that soul bestows life upon animate bodies. So bodies are animated by participation in soul. And so Proclus wraps this up by stating that what he just described here is the distinctive operation of every soul, whereas its other activities, such as intellection and providence, are derived through participation. So animating bodies, giving motion to bodies, these are the distinctive operations of every soul, whether they are divine or not. As for the other activities that he described here, participating in noose and functioning providentially, these are derived for divine souls through participation. In Proposition 202, all souls which are attendant upon gods and perpetually in their company are inferior to the divine grade, but are exalted above the particular souls. So here we see there are three ranks or grades of souls. There's the divine grade. There are those that Proclus calls particular souls. And between them are souls that are attendant on gods and perpetually in their company. Now, it was about a month ago that I released the first video in this section on souls. So those of you who have been following the series as I release the videos might have forgotten how this section began. This section opened with Proposition 184, which reads, Every soul is either divine or subject to change from intelligence to unintelligence or else intermediate between these orders enjoying perpetual intellection, although inferior to the divine souls. 
So here are the three grades of soul. But now Proclus is putting different names on them. The divine souls he still calls divine, but the lowest grade he is now calling particular souls. And whereas before he referred to the middle rank as perpetually participating intellect, he now says they are perpetually in the company of gods. Now this connection to gods was actually first introduced in Proposition 185. I looked at this proposition a moment ago, but just the first line. This one reads, All divine souls are gods upon the psychic level. All those which participate the intellectual intelligence are perpetually attendant upon gods. And all of those which admit of change are at certain times attendant upon gods. So that middle rank of souls that perpetually participate intellect are also perpetually in the company of gods. And that lowest rank, that only intermittently participate intellect, are only attendant upon gods at certain times. And so this is how the section opened, with Propositions 184 and 185. After that, Proclus went on to show various principles about soul in general, um, such as Proposition 186, which reads that every soul is an incorporeal substance and separable from body. Now Proclus is finally picking up this thread again, this idea of three grades of soul. And so we want to see where is he going to go with it. And so he starts off with the divine souls. For the divine souls participate both intelligence and deity. Hence it is that they are at once intellectual and divine. And so that's actually what we just saw in the previous proposition. And now he's going to build on this, adding that divine souls have sovereignty over the other souls, as these gods are sovereign over all that is. And to see this more clearly, let's take a look at Proposition 144. And this proposition focuses on the gods, that the procession of all things existent and all cosmic orders of existence extends as far as do the orders of gods. And in the course of the explanation here, Proclus tells us that even the last kinds in the realm of existence are consequent upon gods who regulate even these, who bestow even on these life and formative power and completeness of being, who convert even these upon their good. And so also are the intermediate and the primal kinds. I think this is a very beautiful proposition, and it's worth reviewing on your own. But briefly here we see that the gods are sovereign over all that is. And remember that we saw in Proposition 185 that divine souls are gods upon the psychic level. And so coming back here to Proposition 202, we see that the divine souls, which function as gods on the psychic level, then would have sovereignty over the other souls. Okay, so in this first sentence, Proclus has summarized the divine souls. They're both intellectual and divine, and they have sovereignty over the other souls. Now he will jump to the opposite end of the series and summarize what he is now calling particular souls. On the other hand, the particular souls are deprived even of attachment to an intelligence, being unable directly to participate intellectual existence. For if in respect of their existence they participated intelligence, they would not fall away from intellectual activity, as has been proved above in Proposition 175. So we want to take a look at Proposition 175. And this proposition is in the section on intelligences. It reads, Every intelligence is primarily participated by principles which are intellectual at once in their existence and in their activity. 
And the part in yellow here reads that in the gradations of activity, there is an intermediate degree between any activity which is eternal and one which is complete in a certain time, namely the activity which has its completion in the whole of time. Accordingly, every intelligence is primarily participated by principles which are at all times capable of intellection and enjoy it perpetually, notwithstanding that they exercise it in time and not in eternity. Okay, so the primary participants then in intellect would be that which, which participates perpetually. And so in the corollary, we see that from this it is apparent that a soul which exercises intellection only at certain times would not directly participate in intelligence. And so here we see that the primary participants in intellect participate perpetually. And then through the mediation of these souls, those that participate intermittently can participate. So now that Proclus has summarized divine souls as the highest grade of soul, and particular souls as the third grade, he will turn his attention to the intermediate grade. And here he writes, Intermediate, therefore, between these two classes stand those souls which are perpetually in the company of gods, which are recipients of a perfect intelligence, and in this regard overpass the particular souls, but they fall short of connection with divine henads, since the intelligence that they participate was not divine. So what? What is going on here? Well, the way I understand these intermediate souls is that they are daimons. We, as rational souls, come to a wisdom tradition in that third rank. Without meditation or other theurgic efforts, we do not directly participate nous. Our aim, through the practices of whatever our chosen system is, is to connect with nous and to participate as closely to that second rank as is humanly possible. Now, as Platonists, we do this mainly through our reading, through contemplation, and through dialectic. These are our main practices. We also do this by cutting away what is false, and in that way we can unify the soul. The significance of these practices is made even clearer in the next proposition. And Proposition 203 reads, In the entire psychic manifold, the divine souls, which are greater in power than the rest, are restricted in number. Those which are perpetually in their company have in the order as a whole a middle station in respect both of power and of multitude, while the particular souls are inferior in power to the others, but are advanced to a greater number. All right, so first off, it is clear that Proclus is building on these three grades of soul that he introduced above and back in 184 and 5. But what exactly he is saying here can be a bit confusing. On first read, it might seem that he is only talking about the number of souls in each grade. And this makes sense. The number of rational souls is greater than the number of daimons, and the number of divine souls is even smaller than that. That's one way to read this, and that certainly is here. But I'm going to suggest that there is a further way to understand this. And this is a way that's not, an, it's not opposed to that first reading, but it adds a deeper layer of meaning to our daily lives as philosophers. This will become clear as we go on. He starts off, for the first class are near akin to the one because of their divine mode of being. The second are intermediate because they participate intelligence. 
and the third are last in rank, differing in their existence both from the intermediate and from the primal. So basically, Proclus is just establishing the ranks or the grades that were discussed in Proposition 202. Now he's going to go on to give us the general principle that he is applying here in this proposition. Now among perpetual principles, those near to the one are more unified in number than the more remote. That is, they are restricted in respect of multitude, while the more remote are more numerous. So this is the general principle that power is commensurate with unity. And that's Proposition 62. And this proposition states that every manifold which is near to the one has fewer members than those that are more remote, but it is greater in power. Now this proposition states clearly that it is referring to the number of members within each manifold. However, I will suggest to you that this same principle also applies to the level of unity within each member, in the current case, and within each soul. That first line in yellow, that which is nearer to the one is more like to it. It will be more unitary and less divisible as the first cause is one, and so it will be more powerful. In other words, the more remote souls are more numerous in the sense of there being more of them, but they're also more numerous in the sense of each soul being more differentiated. And that means that the grade as a whole is less powerful, but so is each member within that grade. Now when we come back to the italics here in 203, we see phrases like restricted in number or advanced to a greater number. This takes on a double meaning. We can talk of the multitude of souls in each grade, but we can also talk of the degree of unity within each. As an example, take any number, say 500. It is a multitude of 500, but it is also a single unit made up of 500 ones. Just as a bouquet of flowers is one bouquet, or a pad of paper is one pad. As a unit, 500 is one unit, and it is more differentiated than the unit 10, for example. Okay, so what? So when we think of souls as a multiplicity, I'm a soul, you're a soul, each soul also experiences varying degrees of differentiation or unity. When our souls are fractured, when we're split in multiple self-images and beliefs, we do not function in a potent way. Applying this principle to the three grades of souls, what would follow is that souls in the third grade or ranking must increase their power in order to participate directly in intellect, in nous. Here is where we see more clearly the need to cut away false beliefs that fragment our soul. When we cut away what is false, we gain one-pointed focus on truth. We unify ourselves, and so we function more potently. I want you to keep this in mind as we go on to the next sentence. Proclus goes on to say, Thus, on the one hand, the powers of the higher souls are greater and bear that relation to the secondary powers which the divine has to the intellectual, and this latter to the psychic or of the soul. Here he is talking about the power of each grade of soul. He is setting up analogies showing that analogy runs through all the grades of reality. And notice that here in this part of the sentence, he is focused on power. Now he's going to tie in number. 
On the other hand, the members of the lower grades are more numerous, since that which is more remote from the one is more manifold, the nearer less so. So now he's focusing on number, but in this context there is clearly a commensurate relationship with power. Now again, it is easy to read this as simply that the number of individual souls is greater. But the more significant point is that each of these individual souls is also more manifold, more fractured, and so functioning at a lesser power. And we see both readings here of this proposition. As an example, just think of your own sense of connection to other human beings. I think we all feel some sense of connection, but most of us, unless maybe we were born with some psychic ability, we do not feel a whole lot. Yet, as a person develops greater internal unity through various theurgic practices, that connection grows. We not only become more unified as an individual soul, but we also feel greater unity with the whole until ultimately we come to identify with the whole. And this shift in identity actually highlights the classic one-many problem that plagues all of metaphysics. Is soul truly a multiplicity, or is it only a one? Ultimately, it is one. And yet, we can talk of realms at which it is a multiplicity. Largely, it is a matter of perspective. I invite you to keep this issue in the back of your mind as I go through Proposition 204, which again has Proclus focusing on souls as a multitude. It reads, Every divine soul is sovereign over many souls which are perpetually in the divine company and over yet more, which are at certain times admitted to that station. Now the imagery here is clearly of each divine soul having a number of perpetual attendants, and an even larger number of intermittent attendants. Hold on to the idea of power and internal unity, though. And again, this builds on Proposition 185, which introduced us to the idea of intellectual souls being attendant upon the gods. The fact that even the third grade of souls are admitted to that station at times is something encouraging. It indicates that growth is possible. For being divine, it must be endowed with the rank of universal sovereignty and primal operation in the order of souls, since in all orders of being the divine is sovereign over the whole. Now, I reviewed Proposition 144 already earlier in this video. That's the one that positioned the gods as sovereign over all that is. And so divine souls, as participating in the gods, function in that sovereign role at the level of soul. And each must govern not merely souls which perpetually enjoy its company, nor merely such as enjoy it intermittently. In other words, they do not govern over one rank only. First, he's going to look at why they cannot govern only over the third rank. For were one of them sovereign over these latter only, how should these be conjoined with the divine soul, being wholly disparate and participating not even in intelligence directly, still less any of the gods? So Proclus is drawing here on the law of similitude. Remember, this lower order does not participate in divine souls directly, but through a median. And were it sovereign over the former only, those souls which are perpetually in the company of divine souls, then how came this series to progress to the lower terms? On this supposition, the intellectual principles will be the lowest, so they would be sterile and incapable of perfecting and exalting further beings. So these souls can participate directly in divine soul, 
But if divine soul governed only over these perpetual participants, then the series would be imperfect. The lower members would be unable to revert to their cause. Such is not the case, though. And so we have to grant that the divine souls govern over the whole of the series. And so of necessity, therefore, to every divine soul are attached directly those souls which at all times accompany it and use an intellectual activity and are linked by an upward tension to intelligences more specific than the divine intelligences. And also in a secondary grade, the particular souls, which through these intermediaries are able to participate intelligence and divine life. For through principles which perpetually participate the higher destiny, the contingent participants are made perfect. Now the last part of the sentence here is pointing to a series of reversions then through causes. Now this whole line of argument, by the way, is very similar to that used back in Proposition 63. This proposition reads, Every unparticipated term gives rise to two orders of participated terms, the one in contingent participants, the other in things which participate at all times and in virtue of their nature. So here what we're seeing is a general rule that there are two grades of participants, perpetual and intermittent. And I highlighted a few points here in the explanation or the proof here to show you the organization. First, he talks about terms participated for a time only. They're not the sole class of participated terms. And he explains why. And then he gives a reason for why the terms enduringly participated are also not the sole class. So it's a very similar line of reasoning that was used in Proposition 204. But here we're seeing the general principle. Proposition 204 is giving us a specific application of this. And so lining the two up, putting them side by side, can be very helpful in seeing what's going on in Proposition 204. Okay, back at Proposition 204, I'm going to go on now to Paragraph 2. Here, Proclus again draws on the principle in Proposition 62 of power being commensurate with unity. He writes, Again, each divine soul must have about it a greater number of souls which intermittently enjoy its company than of souls perpetually attendant. For as the power of the monad declines, it proceeds ever further into plurality, making up in numbers what it loses in power. And there we see the power of the monad declining as it proceeds into plurality, giving us the multitude of souls. Soul as a multitude is not ultimate reality. But in this system, we recognize it as having a mode of reality much as this physical world has a mode of reality, but is not ultimate reality. And moreover, each of the souls perpetually attendant upon gods, imitating its divine soul, is sovereign over a number of particular souls, and thus draws upward a number of souls to the primal monad of the series, of, of the entire series, excuse me. So I see this as the functioning of daimons and true teachers. Their functioning as the median to draw up other souls that are currently weaker in power. And now Proclus's conclusion. Therefore, every divine soul is sovereign over many souls which are perpetually in the divine company and over yet more, which at certain times are admitted to that station. So if you found that helpful, I would appreciate you hitting the like button. That really does help the channel. And also, if you don't already subscribe, I hope you'll think about doing so. And if you have any questions or comments, 
please do not hesitate to put those below.